Welcome back to the Krusty Fox. And after a bit of a hiatus, we're back in action with Sex and the Shitty Season 3, Episode 9, entitled Easy Come, Easy Go. But given our love lone lady's usual antics, you'd have an easier time being Logan Paul's agent. <laughs> Don't forget to check out all the episodes I've covered so far using the on-screen link, subscribe for all the fun to come, and drop a like if you enjoy this latest Hell Ride. And as ever, stick around until the bitter end for the question round. We open on Miranda kissing her pussy goodbye, which for once is not what it sounds like. We find her fresh off the dumping she gave Steve after he attempted to use her as an incubator for what will surely one day reveal itself to be the Antichrist. Beelzebub. Except in three weeks, Steve hasn't gone very far. About 20 feet, to be exact. Miranda's attempt to sneak past him as he sleeps on the sofa is foiled by new puppy Scout, presumably after he smells the cloud of sulfur wafting in after her. Steve invites an unusually empathetic Miranda to come view a potential new apartment with him. Her reaction may be something to do with the fact that with Steve's budget and the average cost of New York real estate, he may well end up commuting in from Detroit. <coughs> Meanwhile, Carrie's doing her best not to screw up the simple task of supporting Aiden at a new designer's showcase. That lasts roughly 30 seconds before she's diving behind a sideboard to avoid an incoming Mr. and Mrs. Big, who are probably there to pick up a large room divider so they don't have to look at each other anymore. On cue, Aiden returns with coffee, and we're treated to an exchange between the four of them so cringeworthy that you could turn it into a Netflix dating show. I know you, baby! I know you! And I saw you and your baby, and I saw you guys were... You were so perfect! <laughs> For a start, Big, in full view of his wife, is visibly furious to see Aiden again. For her part, Natasha seems equally displeased that, in a city as big as New York, Carrie still appears to rival the gravitational pull and destructive power of the average black hole. It falls once more to Carrie's clumsy, affected I Love Lucy routine to save the day. She avoids having to explain to Aiden who the stuck-up toffs visiting his booth are when she spills her entire cup of scalding coffee down Big's crotch. At the very least, his howls of agony prove that he does have some feeling left down there after all. A couple of hours, and more than a couple of drinks later, an inebriated Big makes his way back over to the booth, evidently unable to resist the collapsing neutron star in Carrie's shorts. Conveniently discovering her alone, he wastes no time in telling her that he's planning to leave Natasha, in the least surprising news, this side of James Corden being every waiter's least favourite customer. Carrie at least pretends to Big's face that she's not interested in his unsubtle invitation to climb back aboard the good ship Cialis. But she does excitedly blurt it out to Samantha, Charlotte, and Miranda the next time she sees them, like American Express just introduced a credit limit exception for tacky shoes. Miranda takes the opportunity to suggest that it's all the fault of Big and Natasha rushing into things. A not-so-subtle Big at Charlotte's sprint for the finish line with human melatonin gummy Trey. Ms. York's defense of her newborn relationship is quickly undercut by her gushing admission that she's about to meet her future mother-in-law. She also believes that Trey is on the verge of proposing, in the same way as the Titanic was on the verge of crossing the North Atlantic, presumably. Later on, Miranda dutifully accompanies Steve to his apartment viewing in what appears to be a repurposed wing of Arkham Asylum. Either feeling a pang of guilt or jealousy that one of the other tenants might get to murder him before she can, she convinces him to keep looking. Mulling over all of this back home, Carrie decides it's ripe fodder for her next column. She posits that women are left-brained and therefore more emotional, while men are right-brained and therefore more logical. Boiling the meat off the bones of this complicated issue, her headline ends up being, Is it smarter to follow your heart or your head? Later in the week, Charlotte finally gets her first meeting with MacDougall family matriarch and ancient Lovecraftian nightmare Bunny, who came dressed in a crocheted yellow two-piece skirt set that makes her look like a Sharpay sitting on an Easter bonnet. While thumbing through childhood photos, Trey describes Bunny as a bit of a camera Nazi. The smirk on Mother Dearest's face, however, at a minimum suggests that she picked the name MacDougall out of a whiskey brochure after arriving in America under Operation Paperclip. 
That's when relationship Nazi Charlotte spots something interesting. Rather than run for the hills at the sight of this Oedipal nightmare, or the son in question using the word alrighty twice in quick succession, Oberfuhrer York instead smells opportunity. Samantha, conversely, is going entirely hands-free when she dines at film editor Adam's downstairs buffet. As a slight aside, Adam is played by a very welcome Bobby Cannavale, who is aged like a fine wine. Something which doesn't age like a fine wine, however, is Adam's bonk juice, which Samantha later describes as... Like, asparagus gone bad or something. After consulting with the others during a typically sex-negative brunch, she turns her attention to nutrition's role in the flavour profile of snot. Who said my videos don't lend a touch of class to your day? <laughs> that night, Carrie and Aiden's pillow talk turns to renovations, giving away his simmering sense of horror that a woman in her 30s has allowed herself to live in an apartment with load-bearing shoeboxes. He offers to spruce the place up himself, which to most girlfriends would be looked upon as a kind and loving gesture. But to Carrie, definitely reads as free labour and f**k all else. While Carrie's committing employment fraud, Samantha's downtown convincing an unsuspecting Adam to unsour his pole milk with some superfoods. After a shot of healthy green sludge, and the least amount of time possible for it to work its way into his coin purse, Sam rushes him home for a taster session. Putting aside the fact that Adam elects to have his bobo honked in front of a full-length mirror, Miss Jones discovers firsthand that the interwebs are full of lies when she takes delivery of yet another load of layonnaise past its expiry date. <laughs> at their bunny-approved dinner, Charlotte's barely contained glee at being able to MK Ultra her boyfriend backfires. When she deploys Mother MacDougall's trademark mind control method to extract a proposal from him before dessert, she ends up asking for her own hand in marriage with all the romantic spectacle of that guy who got down on one knee in McDonald's. Trey manages to sway his materialistic betrothed with a later visit to Tiffany's for an engagement ring, leading to Charlotte deciding that she'll just lie about the circumstances. And as everyone knows, deception is the best foundation for a marriage. If that is, you want your union to last about as long as you can keep your dinner down while reading Prince Harry's autobiography. My penis was oscillating between extremely sensitive and borderline traumatised. The last place I wanted to be was Frost Nippistan. The next morning at Miranda's place, there's an awkward moment when Steve returns after pulling an all-nighter with a new mystery woman. Correctly reading the room for a change, he promises to move out the same day so that Miranda and her pussy don't have to witness his seemingly 24 carat crotch vomiter making its way through the city's bafflingly intrigued women folk. <coughs> At Carrie's apartment, Aiden's noisy reenactment of the first five minutes of every gay porno while she's trying to write <laughs> cause her terminally sheltered ass to realise that DIY work can't be done quietly. Inconvenienced, as she so often is, by acts of love and affection, she huffs herself down to a room at a nearby hotel, where the only distractions are from housekeeping and somebody blasting through the pelvic floor of their secretary in the next room. Elsewhere, Samantha's taking another spin on Adam when he decides it's time for a hummer. His confusion over her refusal leaves her no choice but to admit that his throat yogurt is on the turn and to claim that men don't know what women have to deal with down there. Some men do, Samantha. Some men do. She does, however, strike a bargain with him. She'll suffer through it, but only if he gives his chode nectar a try too. Adam, a factory default straight guy to his core, bless him, worries aloud that downing a dram of his own love liquor would be gay. But if a single drop is enough to turn a damp squib, this is an awesome fact. I'm extremely allergic to dogs. Into a flamer. Wow, hey people. <laughs> then some of us must be on the verge of ascending to a higher form of homosexual consciousness by now. Swayed by the promise of more head than Henry VIII's trophy room, Adam reluctantly agrees. 
And despite looking like someone just ran in and spat weak old fish pie into his open mouth, he claims to be fine with it. Bested for once, Samantha dutifully goes to work. Although, biologically speaking, Adam must be some kind of sexual superhuman, considering that what he taste tested had to have been freshly produced. But he's then apparently ready to go again immediately. Dude must have the refractory period of a dying rabbit. Deeply ensconced within her Huff Hotel, Carrie finds Big's stalking abilities on par with her own when he tracks her down and demands an audience. Hello? What are you wearing? She finds him in his natural habitat, the bar, where he correctly assesses Carrie's reluctance to tell Aiden who he is as a sign that she's still into him. She almost makes it back to her room sans idiot when Big chases her into the elevator. We then get, and I don't think I'm overstating this, a troubling scene which, if transplanted from this dramedy setting into a different show, would read very, very differently. You. I'm not going to dwell on the details, but suffice to say that it's more than a little no means yes, despite her eventual reciprocation. For a series attempting to blaze a trail of empowerment in the late 90s and noughties, it all comes across very... Goldfinger. And so it comes to pass that while devoted boyfriend Aiden is sanding the floors up in Carrie's apartment, slimy ex-Biggs knocking through the walls down in her basement. A grim euphemism, for sure, but no more grim than the idea that anyone thinks this is another page in some timeless love story. And we're far from done. But I'm getting ahead of myself once again. For now, let's look at last video's top comment, wherein I asked how you'd handle a declaration of love after two weeks. Commenter Kevin Jones took the win on this one, succinctly saying that anyone trying that on him would need their running shoes on. That's it, Kevin. Make them work for it. As for this video, what I'm dying to know is, have you ever had to live with an ex? And if so, did you live to regret it? Answers in the comments below, please, and the best will invade your personal space next time. Either way, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and remember, if you can't be good, be crusty.